I'm very humbled and extremely excited to present to you the three Nobel laureates of ke uh, chemistry today, Jacques Debussy, Joachim Frank and Richard Henderson, um, because I use the technology the Nobel Prize is about basically on an everyday basis. And we were pretty hyped when these guys got the prize. Um, in addition, I had uh, the great advantage to meet two of them, well said, so before, uh, before they received the Nobel Prize at conferences, really great scientists wanting to bring the field forward, always supporting young scientists, um, willing to talk to them, giving them advice. It's really great. So um, let's see why these three received the Nobel Prize and what it is actually about. This is the title, just going to read it out. Developing cryo-electron microscopy for the high-resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution. All right, so what is this in English now? Um, taking a look at it, uh, so the first thing describes the technology, this cryo-electron microscopy. I'm going to tell you what it is today and a little bit how it works. And they use this technology to target life sciences and they want to look at proteins. And thanks to these three guys, we look in such a great detail that we can identify the amino acids, the building blocks of the proteins, or even atoms. Okay, so, shortly, you remember this slide maybe from the talk before, just repeat it in a second. So, genes are important, we know that, they are in our DNA in these, these small segments, and these segments get uh, a copy of them, is made, it's called the RNA, and this RNA can be translated into a protein. Okay, we all know that now. Um, but what are these proteins? What are they made of? Why are they so important? Okay, proteins, they are made out of amino acids. These are the small building blocks, and depending what amino acids they are and how many, these proteins can have different shapes. And they can have a shape like this or a shape like this. And it gets really interesting if you combine different proteins because then you can get something like a macromolecular machine that really does something. For, for example, you can imagine this small thing to transport something from one area in the cell to another, so a small car or transport protein. Uh, how does this look in real life? This is an artist uh, impression of the HIV virus. Uh, not only the coat in brown, but also these cone shapes that are sticking out, that is all proteins, and these adapters are used to attach to cells and later infect them. So it's, under, it's interesting to understand how these proteins look like, how they work. This Y-shaped thing, also an artist impression here, these are antibodies, completely made out of proteins. They help us defend against foreign invaders. And if you later, maybe in the break, have a small snack or a beer, uh, then uh, you will need enzymes to break down the food. Enzymes are proteins. And I guess you get where I'm going. Everything is proteins, or almost everything. And they make the cells work. So, if we are now a f scientist, independent what sort of, and we want to understand how does a certain protein or macromolecular complex work, um, either to find a cure because it's defect, or uh, we want to prevent a virus from entering the cells, we have to understand the structure. So how would you go about it? You First you have to um, extract out of a bacteria or a cell or animal cells, whatever it is you're targeting, you have to extract your protein that you're interested in, your complex. Then you put it into a microscope. The microscope produces us images. We use powerful computers to generate a 3D structure. And then by understanding how it works, we can make the world a better place. And that is it, what it is in science all about. Okay, so much for the rough overview. In the center of it all is the microscope. This is the technology aspect I'm talking about and the Nobel Prize is about the cryo-electron microscope, cryo-EM. Cryo, well, because something is frozen, working on the condition where something will be frozen, more to this in a few slides. Electron, because we are losing electrons to create our image. Well, in the microscope, we look at something which is very small and we magnify it. So why do we use electrons for this? Well, if you use the human eye, you can obviously see me. You could see something which is a little bit smaller, like a child. You can see my hand, my finger. Uh, on the hair, it might get already a little bit difficult. So at some point, you might want to have a light microscope. You can see blood cells then even, or bacteria. But there are physical limitations 
uh, a light microscope can only get so far. And if you want to look at the real small things that make up life, like the proteins, DNA, uh, the amino acids, or even atoms, you need an electron microscope to get there. Okay, electron microscope, um, that's how it looks like. These people are not very small, the microscope is just very large. So five meters, it wouldn't fit into this room, colleagues from Denmark right here. And these are your very friendly uh, neighborhood scientists in front of a microscope inspection. He's a colleague of mine. And you see there's a lot of tubings, wirings, it's a very complicated machinery in the background. And there is this big column right here. And through these columns, the electrons come from top. And if you look, here's a small representation how it works. Electrons come from top, they will penetrate a small droplet of our sample and we will get an image. And going to the first Nobel laureate here, Richard Henderson, 1990, he could show as a proof of concept that these electron microscopes, which have been used for tons of other things before, uh, can give you an atomic resolution of a protein. And that proved the technology's potential and created this big hype of life science, basically moving into this uh, technology in order to visualize proteins and understand how they work. This is him, professor at the MSc Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge in the UK at the moment. So, okay, Richard Henderson showed us how it's w that it was possible. Now let's do the same thing. We have a protein in a small plastic tube and we want to bring it into the microscope and look at it. How do we go about it? So, in here, that's just a small liquid solution. We will have our proteins and actually they don't look like this, it more looks like this. Because even at room temperature, if you can't see it, the nanoparticles, they are freely mobile, they are always tumbling, and we have to somehow stop this and freeze them in order to image them. Otherwise, all this tumbling, we won't get a sharp image. So they have to freeze, just like when the video stops right here. And so we want to get from this to a frozen state uh, where we can image them. Okay, then let's just put them into the freezer for an hour or then they will be frozen and everything is fine. Um, people tried that. Problem is ice crystals. And ice crystals, they will destroy these very small proteins, the molecular machines, and shear them apart. So if we freeze them and get ice crystals, we won't be able to see anything because there will only be fragments left. So ice crystals are bad and we had to find a way to get the uh, protein's movement arrested uh, in some way without creating ice crystals. And this is where Jacques de Bichet comes into play and he perfected something which is called vitrification. So what is this exactly? And I do this, everybody who works in CryoEM does this all the time. Tiny drop of the sample is placed onto a copper grid, just a small copper grid, three millimeters in diameter. If we look at the side, we will see a small liquid drop on top, only three microliters are needed, it's not much, the grid is very thin, and the excess liquid blob is blotted away, and then we only have a very small, very thin uh, liquid film, and this is then frozen in liquid ethane, cooled by liquid nitrogen, minus 200 degrees, and the sample, thanks to the liquid ethane, it freezes so fast that ice crystals don't form. And then you get something very special, this is called vitreous ice. It's basically a solid liquid. Sounds kind of crazy, but it's true. It's basically a solid thing that isn't a crystal and has been liquid before. If you freeze very fast, you can achieve that. And Jacques de Boucher in the 1980s, he perfected this. Bio and he could show that biomolecules in vitrified ice retain their natural shape, great, even in the aggressive vacuum of the electron microscope. Uh, and thanks to this, we now finally can take an image. Okay, let's continue on. This is him at University of Lausanne in Switzerland, also a professor. So, if you now want to take an image uh, of a protein with electrons, imagine the beam are coming from the front. Yes, uh, it's the electron beam, and you have a protein which is frozen like this. Then you will get an image like this. But take note, if the protein has been oriented differently, you will get an image like this. Still the same protein, it's just a different view. And an interesting challenge then also will be, imagine you have a protein that lives long and prosper. <laughs> Might look like this from this way, 
but might look very similar than the open hand from this way. And that's a challenge that people often face if they don't have a clean sample. You have to find out what is the protein you're interested in and what is the other stuff. Okay, so how does this work in the microscope? Here we have an example of the three molecules trapped in different orientations. The electron beam will come from top, underneath in former times photographic film, now di direct electron detectors. Every electron can be detected and they move through and create a unique shadow. Shadow, because it's not a real shadow, but contains the internal information of the molecule as well. And then you get these 2D images. This is what uh, an electron microscope image will look like. And if you now take a closer look, you can find one few is pretty similar. This one here, just a few examples. And these are other views. So this is a side view, for example, and this is a top view of the protein we are searching for. But we don't see amino acids here that looks quite, uh, quite fuzzy still. And this is what the images look like when they are boxed out. And I'm trying to tell you now we can see atoms from this. You can even see the pixels there. So uh, there's a trick to get this done in the end, is that you group together the same images of the same orientation like this. They are rotated, that they show all the same positioning, and then you put them together, overlay them, and then, oh ha, you get a super sharp image um, and a more, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. compared to before. Um, and of course, this is just a small example. The more images you use, the sharper and more accurate this will get and the less noise you will have in the background. And then we repeat this. You remember the uh, example with the hand with different orientations. For example, here you see you have quite a lot. There, not so much of these orientations. This is why you have more noise in the background. And then you can combine them computationally. Out of 2D, you recreate the 3D structure. And remember, we have this special shadow, so to say, meaning we don't just get the outer shape, we get the interior as well, and then we have a complete 3D model of the protein. Uh, Joachim Frank, here in the middle, he showed uh, and developed the image processing method that uh, fuzzy two-dimensional images can be analyzed and merged together, and in the end, reveal a sharp 3D structure. Okay, and he is currently residing at Columbia University, New York, in the US, also a professor. This is, I rendered this just for you today from a very cool model uh, a colleague has. This is a three-dimensional structure, the electron density, how it comes from the microscope. And if you look at this, you'll be like, okay, that's a very nice artistic sculpture you have there. What is this exactly? Since we know the genetic code, and we know by this the amino acids the protein has, we can now model the amino acids inside correctly and see where do these amino acids make what interactions. How does the critical functional side of a protein looks like? How does the area looks like where it couples to another protein or a, vi a virus wants to adapt to get attached, integrated into the cell? Is there maybe a mutation and something is missing because this protein is not functioning, the person is ill. You can find out a lot of interesting stuff if you know a high level, if you can reconstruct a high level three-dimensional structure. Examples, we heard about this one before. This is the protein of the circadian rhythm that keeps our internal clock in check, solved by cryo-EM. The pressure sensor that hopefully makes you hear me and maybe also understand me. Um, you have in the ear, which basically helps you hear, the Circa virus, which caused a lot of problems for in infants in the recent years, also visualized by cryo-EM with the goal to find a cure. So cryo-EM, as you see, very powerful. And thanks to these three, nowadays, uh, nearly every corner of the cell can be captured in atomic detail. And thanks to this, we can not only understand, but also cure a lot of things more. And it will get now very, very exciting uh, since this technology received so much attention with the Nobel Prize. I want to thank, of course, the scientists, but also the team uh, of 15X4 for supporting this great environment and supporting me in polishing this talk. I work at the LMU, to be specific, at Gene Center Munich, great working environment out in Großhadern, and I'm very happy to take questions from you now, or in the break, or you can write me, and I will answer you. Thank you very much.
question. Yeah. Yes. How, how much time does it take to make a model of a wooden object? So a uh, funny thing, it, this has been a little bit of a sport. So people try to uh, come from sample purification, as we say, to a model in 24 hours. This is possible if you know what you want to reconstruct. If, uh, like you say, okay, you want to show that this can be done really fast, it can be done, has been done in 24 hours, a little bit more maybe. If you're working uh, with something what where you don't know what it looks like or your resolution is not good enough that you can model it in the end, it might take much more time to refine uh, the structure. So can be done within a few days, I would say, up to several weeks or months if you have a really challenging, complicated project. Yes? I am um, very often where you have experiments like this, uh, you also have uh, simulation. Mm -hmm. for the same things. Mm -hmm. So, is there a capable a simulative approach uh, for uh, reconstructing uh, molecular processes or this kind of process? It's a very, that's a very cool question. So people, of course, try to predict how proteins look like, but at some points, especially if the proteins get too big and the complexes get too big, the, pro, uh, the question are so, uh, are so extensive that um, despite the super powerful computers we have nowadays, uh, the prediction cannot replace this. Um, of course, uh, secondary structure prediction exists, which already tells you, okay, this area might be a little bit formed like this, the other area a little bit formed like this. But how the connections work, um, and especially how the proteins then get together, uh, simulation sadly won't do it, hopefully for us, doesn't do it yet. Yeah, I'd like to understand the last thing you showed. Mm -hmm. So you would... Um, Kind of in theory, you would know how such a protein is built, but you don't know like how it looks like, how they kind of dock to each other. So Therefore, you need the hmm. microscope? Or okay, it's a good question because maybe this was a little bit too fast in the end. So um, the point is we know, we know the code, but um, this goes a little bit into the simulation question. We don't know what it looks like, and especially the complicated machines, which uh, have a hundred of proteins, and then also RNA segments in between. Um, you, you might not have an idea how this looks like. So you need to model all these small proteins in one after the other, and in the end you can uh, understand the machine. But you need cryoEM to have something to build it in. Otherwise, you just have the amino acid code, but you don't know how it looks like. Could be formed a line, could be a circular shape. Uh, you need somewhere to model it in. Another technology exists. It's called crystallography, where you crystallize a protein and then also get a structure. This is another possibility. Question from this side. Um, when you have different proteins in the solution, um, how do you define which view belongs to which protein and then you combine the 3D views? Okay. So you combine 2D views into the 3D. Yes, so this can, uh, uh, I want to start off with saying this is a big problem. Ima so taking a picture takes some time. And let's say you can take 2,000 pictures a day, and then you have on one picture 50 of your, of your images. And if you maybe get into the 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, uh, you can reconstruct a nice 3D structure. Maybe you want 50,000 to get a real high resolution model. Depends on the size, but let's stick with that. If suddenly uh, only half of the proteins are of interest because you have some impurities with it, or only one tenth, then suddenly you have to collect for a very, very long time, which might not even be physically possible in order to get what you want. And what we do is, so we try to find fuse that overlap, and then you have to make the critical decision which fuse belong together. So normally you might have some idea what your protein looks like. If you don't, it is really difficult to differentiate, especially if it is the same size, is this just some, let's say, garbage that I co-purified, or is this my protein? for a real de novo structure, where you don't have any prior knowledge, a very difficult problem. Oh. Okay, one, one last one. Um, so you said that so it's kind of hit and trial to predict from the 2D to the 3D structure of the protein. So let's say if there are some false positive in that, mm -hmm. how do you detect that it's a false positive? Um, so uh, in or so the normally, um, you give the 2D images a 3D model to align. So you ha have maybe some idea how your protein looks like, or 
you have a protein where you know what it looks like, couple another one to it, and you don't know how it looks like, um, so you can align the 2D images as a base. If this works, and you have some which don't belong there, they will align randomly, create, so to say, more noise for your model, but they won't disrupt it in a meaningful way. If you have too much of this, your three-dimensional model will essentially be useless or not refined to high resolution. That's also something where that we uncover, where you have to say, okay, maybe my model doesn't refine good enough, I have to look back at the images, maybe I included too much uh, uh, of the stuff I don't want that prevents me from reaching the high quality I want in the end. Thank you very much. We will have now a break and you can ask Andre every question that you would like. Um, <laughs> so.